What are your expectations when it comes to your children? Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 61, Raised Bilingual Children with Jessie Sweet. I have known Jessie for quite some time now, and it's fascinating to me to learn from him. More than learn to be inspired by his amazing content that continually teaches us parents how to deal with amazing children because they become more and more amazing as long as we decide that it's all in our hands a bit about jesse before we start our very anticipated conversation of the day Originally from the United States, he first lived outside of his country in 2006 and has lived abroad ever since. He has lived in South Korea and now he lives in Spain where he is raising two beautiful children. Jesse spent most of his career teaching English for people of all ages and levels from small children to business owners and everything in between. He has recently turned his focus on helping parents realize the limitless nature of their children, and his mission is to empower parents so that they can raise empowered kids. I am absolutely loving this. He does this by teaching them how to raise their kids to be bilingual. And I also have a child, Isabel is two years and a half. And to be honest, I am learning so much from Jesse's amazing input. Jesse, welcome. What a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Roxana. What an introduction. And when you th were talking about your two and a half year old, I was nodding highly in agreement. And because I thought it was going to go, I've been learning so much from her, which I'm sure you have been too. So then when you said you've been learning from my stuff, I'm nodding in agreement here. Like, yes, I create awesome content. But, uh, but that's the story behind that. But thank you for the introduction. This is really exciting to do this. Love it, Jesse. And I do think that your insight is fantastic. I keep watching your TikToks and I always invite everyone to watch them because there's so much amazing wisdom. Since you have your own children, it's so much easier to teach other people. It's not like you are doing this from books. So this is why I think that your activity is so priceless. You walk the talk. I see you having many amazing games with your children. So Jesse, can you please start by telling us how did you get in this amazing point in your life to start teaching parents to raise bilingual children? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's a story. And that's as many stories, actually. But yeah, as you mentioned in the introduction, I started and I still do. I teach non-native English speakers how to become, you know, fluent and how to take command of their, um, <laughs> their you'll, you'll hear them in the background here, uh, how to take command of their language. And something as I grow personally and as I grow as a parent, like we said right in the beginning, we learn so much from our kids. I've learned that's one of it's hard. I'm in parenting groups and they've asked, what is my favorite part? I don't know what my favorite part is, but a really good advantage is how much I learn from them, how much I learn from how they learn, how much I learn from how like the the topic of your podcast, how they are not afraid of mistakes, how they're not afraid of looking silly and they're not afraid of asking for help when they need it. And um, so I guess it came down from like teaching language and coaching language and studying language to seeing the tremendous benefits. My daughter's seven now, my son's five, and the tremendous benefits that being raised bilingual has, right? I see how they seamlessly go back and forth from Spanish to English. And um, and it's just impressive to me. And I see it as an advantage over other 
kids, right? And then plus teaching in academies. And I don't know if you know this, but my grandmother is Mexican and she was a Spanish teacher. Being a Spanish teacher, as you know, it's different than working with your own kids a lot, right? So she came home from teaching, you know, and your own kids uh, argue and they fight. Hold on a second. And they they protest. My kids did too. When I put English on in the TV, they would protest at first. I want it in Spanish. I want it in Spanish. So what I've done, I've come up with ways to make it you know, non-confrontational, to make it effortless, to make it fun and uh, easy to incorporate another language into raising your kids. So, uh, and that's where it came from because my grandmother didn't pass the language down to her kids. And in turn, I, you know, my mom doesn't speak Spanish. We don't speak Spanish. I'm learning from here, but imagine what it would have done if we had generations of Spanish just continued throughout the family line, what that would have done for us. And that's what I want to do for other parents. Wow. I really am so grateful that you mentioned this. It's your guys's legacy that your family legacy that you want to pass on forward. Amazing. And Jesse, can you please tell us when it comes to business and you moving from different parts of the world now now you're in europe and it was so funny when a few days ago i read your introduction you have not been to the usa ever since <laughs> you have left the place and i'm actually thinking of going there for a while because i have such a great attraction for for that part of the world with my business i wanted to ask you how do you see fear with traveling children, business, a different culture? How was it for you? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I have gone back. I just haven't lived back there since 2006, but I've gone back to visit. Um, so it was interesting. When I first went to South Korea, I don't really consider that I had culture shock. I kind of, I was 26 at the time, 25, 26, and I just saw it as an adventure. So there's there's bliss and ignorance. You know what I mean? There's a bliss when you don't know. And that's why, you know, a lot of younger entrepreneurs succeed really quickly because they just don't they don't know. You know, ignorance is bliss, as we say. So when I first moved abroad, I saw everything as an adventure. Right. Going to the supermarket in Korea when, you know, the letters are complete. The characters are completely different than in English. Um, and what I was used to getting on a bus, hoping you go the right way, um, which I have gone the wrong way on the bus and ended up in a completely part of wrong part of town in South Korea. That was an interesting adventure. But um, so it's just like seeing it as an event. It's framing what I'm learning now is what I did. I framed my situation, which I didn't know that term then. But you reframe your situation to you know, to your advantage, you know, um, and in business, I have a lot of fear now because I do have more life experience. I do have more responsibilities. So there is more that, that fear that I'm dealing with now than when I was younger. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing your experience. And I love your very honest and very open point of view with fear. Many people try to kind of hide it and say, it's it's okay, I can do it even if I feel fear. But no, let's feel it, let's embrace it because it's real. Mm. And I think it's awesome that you say this, one of my few guests that are literally so open about this. It's nothing wrong if you feel fear, it's normal, it's very natural. We all feel it. I maybe feel it more than anyone else because I put a lot of focus on it just to understand every single side of it. And I'm still alive and kicking, <laughs> so it's okay. Nothing wrong with feeling fear. And Jesse, when it comes to you framing personal development to your advantage, because I know that 
you are into positive things since you do a lot of amazing work on yourself. I know that you are putting a lot of focus on your growth. What would you say that the best thing for someone that is at the beginning of their journey would be in business? However, not falling into the trap of too much positivity and daydreaming, because I have a feeling that you are more of a realist more than anything else. I, uh, that's interesting. Um, I have people telling me that, and I also have people telling me that I'm more of a dreamer. So I have people telling me both. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. So I'm actually trying to find that balance, to be honest, the, the imagining and focusing on your vision and focusing on your imagination and building your life. Like this is all of the personal development stuff that I'm living through and I'm working through and I'm working on practicing and implementing is creating your life with your imagination and through your imagination and turning your imagination into reality. And the question is, when does that you know, become a fantasy only, you know, that's the, that's the question. And I don't know yet. I, and um, that's all I can say. I, it's something that I'm figuring out. I guess the biggest difference probably is the word implementation, like implementing like something, um, implementing the steps, like, because it's really, easy i think i find it easy some people don't but i find it easy to meditate you know and imagine and envision uh but then sometimes um it comes like okay when does that become action and then it's like oh i could do that and then i think it comes down to procrastination i think my fear takes the form of procrastination and I wonder if anyone else who's watching and any of your listeners kind of can relate. And I think my what we what's probably fear looks more like procrastination. I can relate to this, Jesse. Thank you for bringing this into our talk today, because I can still after more than 10 years of personal development, I still find myself giving myself too much time with maybe still looking on social media more than I could. Then I just put my phone away and I ask myself, okay, why did I do this? Why did I just do this when I have so many months already of me working on social media and not giving it too much attention? I ask myself, why did I do this? And then the truth comes out I'm just afraid to send that email, Jesse. I'm just afraid to go and contact someone for my business. And it's fascinating how our mind works. Yeah. When we what just are you afraid of, do you think? Because I've asked myself that too. I've, I, and I'm just asking because I've asked myself, I don't know if we can do, you know, have a yes, sort of like a- Yes, I love it. Session. I absolutely um, love it. I'm still afraid awesome. of rejection still afraid of rejection because my best job in the world was a people pleaser since mm -hmm. i still need to work on it i still have quite a way quite a long way to deal with this i still have this need of getting the yes from a guest when i send them a proposal to be on my podcast i still have the need from a manager to give me the yes you are going to train our team when I don't get the yes, when I get a maybe, when I maybe don't get an answer in a few days, then I feel, oh, am I doing things right? Am I on the right track? I start doubting myself. Mm. Luckily, I realize that I'm in my head. I need to get out of creating stories because this is the mental pain that we mostly struggle with when we create stories that have nothing to do with reality. Maybe that person hasn't even received that email. Maybe mm. something has happened and they just simply are in a position where they don't need any support with what I'm offering and that's okay. 
And through the years, I've learned to not take anything personal. We mm -hmm. just give meaning to everything. Nothing has meaning unless we give it to them, to that person, to that thing, that experience. And um, sometimes it's it's still taking around half an hour, Jesse, for me to remember that. Because, of course, I know all of the processes and the questions. But since I'm still human, the last time I checked, <laughs> it does take a bit of time for me to be in that place that I don't like anymore, that doubt, that uncertainty, it's uncomfortable. Then I remember, oh, but I can do things in a different way. And I'm sharing this with you and to everyone watching and listening us because it's normal. Although I'm a fear specialist, it is perfectly natural to go into fear, to let it consume you. And then Hopefully, the more you work on this, the more you understand it's all in your head, however it is real. Because Jesse, if it keeps you from sending the email, from doing amazing things with your family, with your children, it's real. You feel it in your body. We cannot say that, oh, it's not real. I can handle it. No, don't reject what you're feeling. Embrace it, accept it, and then the solution will arise. What do you think, Jesse? Yeah, it's funny you said that because that it's real and you feel it in your body. Actually, earlier today we went to um a little a little Christmas activity and just as uh I apologize. So um we went to this little Christmas activity and one of these was it was a a uh what do you call it in a roller coaster a virtual reality roller coaster and it looked so it looked like an animation but the feelings you got climbing up to the top slowly the same as a real roller coaster i got the same sensation in my stomach by watching virtual reality glasses the same feeling in my stomach that nervous feeling going up the roller coaster as if it were the real thing, the anticipation as it like went up into my throat. I got that same feeling sitting in like movie theater seats, safe in a room. It was incredible. And it reminded me of this very same thing, both the fear side, and I didn't even apply it to that actually, but it's so true that it's the same emotions as fear as like something harmful is going to be to come to us, but also the success side. How can we turn that on the other side of the coin and have those same feelings about our successful vision, our successful selves? And that's how I kind of looked at it as well. Wow, I love this. What a great example, Jesse. Now you made me so curious the Christmas fair you have in Spain, it's amazing. I'm so curious. We have cute things here. We were here as well uh, last night, but it was more like with uh, all sorts of um, Christmas trees and fun um, lights and music, nothing of that sort. So, okay, we may want to check this <laughs> within the following months because you're yeah, having such out. a great time. Uh, I it was love so it. Cool. You are giving us such a real example of real life situations and it's only normal that we validate ourselves. I want us to be really clear with not expecting anyone else to validate what we feel. For example, if you were to tell this to someone else, they may say, well, Jesse, you were just too focused on that experience. It couldn't have been really that real. It's so important that we learn how to truly 100% believe that everything that we feel, we are worthy of feeling. We need to feel it. And we feel it because there's a message there. There's mm. something that we maybe need to look deeper. And I'm mentioning this from the business side. For example, let's say that we are about to start a very important presentation in front of uh, a few very important managers, a team of 50 people, and we feel that our heart is going to be going crazy. 
That's a message, Jesse. That is our body through fear telling us that we need to slow it down and completely remove the focus from us to the team, to the people that we would be serving. Then you'll see how everything quiets down. It's so much better. No more stress, no more adrenaline. Everything looks uh, and feels so much quieter in ourselves. So I'm enjoying this example so much. And I'm so grateful that you mentioned implementing, implementing steps. I'm also taking notes and I advise everyone watching us and listening to us to get notes because Jesse is amazing in explaining with very relatable examples. And I'm taking notes too, by the way. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so that's we're awesome. taking notes of each other. Listeners should take notes. That yeah. is awesome. I think it's the only way to learn. Just be open to sometimes maybe unlearn some things. Why not just make room for more awesome experiences that come from the person in front of you? Why not? Absolutely. And, and so I love what you said, um, you know, to allow yourself to feel these feelings. And I think that's something I'm working with a couple uh, parents right now. And a lot of the work is encouraging that. It's just that it's encouraging feeling these feelings. And I know it's like bilingual, but we haven't even touched on that yet. <laughs> so there's a lot of like really underneath the surface things that we deal with that we that are connected to our final destination that are connected to other areas of life. And some of that is allowing yourself to feel these things because the more we resist them, the harder they will push back. And a lot, one of the biggest things is, and I know you've talked about this before on previous episodes, cause I, you know, I follow your content and I enjoy your content. Um, like you've talked about mom guilt, you know, and that's a real thing. And something, by the way, any fathers that are listening, um, there's a lot of dad guilt, too, that people, I think, don't, you know, kind of realize. But I think it comes as part of being a parent. And um, you question yourself, you know, did I do this? Did I, you know, I messed that up, especially becoming more and more aware of our subconscious programming then I've gotten a lot of guilt. I'm, I'm thinking like, did I just create a lifelong trauma just by something simple? Because they happen to, at the seemingly least impactful times are the things that like impact us that we don't even realize. And, um, but a lot of it is helping mothers, you know, and fathers like feel those feelings and then they can start to process them and understand another thing is understanding that you're not the only one. I just had this with uh, someone just yesterday, like you're not the only one going through this, you know, for example, tantrums or for example, you know, biting or for example, whatever, um, you know, going crazy in the middle of the supermarket like, I know you can feel like, oh, I'm t everyone's thinking that I'm a terrible parent and everyone's thinking this or that. For one, they're not. And for two, if they are, who cares what they think? And um, and it's not only you, you know, uh, that it's there's a name for it, the terrible twos or whatever, terrible threes, whatever. I don't like that name, but there's a name for it because it's so common. And I think if we realize that you're not the only one, that helps a lot. Wow, thank you for saying that. You literally just answered the next question that I had in mind. How do you deal with two kids? Because I have one, it's sometimes out of control, but it's just the way things are. And as you said, Jesse, very wise, do not resist the feeling. It is how it is. It's completely normal. And I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned mother guilt, I love it that, you know, I had most of my guests, um, we were talking about kids, they were mothers. As a dad, how do you deal with all of the emotions, all of the new, the challenges, 
the need of patience on a regular basis. Is there a secret that you put in practice? Yeah, I don't know if there's a big secret, but uh, I do a couple things to put into practice. I can share two of the biggest things that helped me, especially when they were babies. Now I, I kind of am more in control of myself so I, I take things in stride. I think, I think patience is a gift of mine to be honest. Like we have our gifts. And I think also that's another thing, recognizing and acknowledging your gifts rather than being like fake humble and like, uh, no, I, I'm, I, one of my gifts is patience. And, uh, but that's not to say I don't struggle. And uh, so when they were babies, especially everything's new, you feel guilty, you know, you feel like, oh, my God, they're crying and they're going crazy. Am I like, why? Here's two things that helped me. And one, I used to watch a lot of nature documentaries and BBC Earth with David Attenborough. So one thing I realized is that it's human nature, like this is the human process humans are animals. So I would watch them, especially with my oldest Sophia when she was a baby. And she's probably listening right now back there. Um, and crazy, I would breathe first, I would breathe, I was focused on my breath to like, you know, level myself. And then I would just like, narrate what she was doing as if I were David Attenborough, and I would even use his voice in my side of my head, sometimes verbally, like the human child. And I'd take her name out, right? Like I'm watching a document. The human child is not happy at the moment. She is demonstrating this by screaming. And, and Brilliant. Brilliant. It worked so well. It worked so well. Oh my God, this is amazing, Jesse. You are so inventive and creative. And I've noticed this from the games that you mentioned on TikTok when you had fun in the park with them. This is awesome. Thank you for saying this. So you do nature documentaries. I'm sure that our uh, listeners that have children are going to come to you. <laughs> Just <laughs> thank you for this advice alone. This is awesome. What yeah. I do, Jesse, is to apologize. It may sound very strange, but what I do... Of course, each situation. Apolo is wait, different. Kind of apologize to yourself. Apologize, apologize to them when to they're her. crazy. Apologize okay. to her. For me, when I raise my voice, it means that a few hours of tantrums have already happened. It's how much I've trained myself, a lot of patience. So when I raise my voice, everyone around me knows that, okay, things are very serious. So what I do, I just. Uh, remove myself from the situation I take a minute to get my composure back because I know that nothing really happens I'm not going to help her I'm not going to help myself if I raise my voice it's just me out of fear again out of fear not knowing how to deal with a situation we get angry when we are fearful Jesse so we also need to embrace this as parents and I'm sure that everyone watching us and listening us listening to us can agree. So I, I, um, I'm I, thinking as well as you are, am I creating a trauma in my kid? What am I doing here? Since every day is different, I cannot relate to any other circumstance that may have happened a few days ago. So I just uh, explained to Isabel, look, mommy is sorry for raising her voice. It's not you it's me not yet understanding every part of uh, dealing with this situation, not me understanding how I should be doing my very best to give you what you need in that very moment. Because let's be honest, the child, until there may be six or seven, and you can correct me on this, Jesse, this is from what I read, they don't have too much discernment they don't really understand what's going on. They mainly just let their emotions take over. So when I kind of lose my patience, she knows that it's not her fault. And this to me gives me that encouragement that I know that my parents have not given me when I was a child to know that, okay, it's not my fault. 
uh, me as a child, I'm safe. Mommy loves me. We are going to get through this situation together. So it may be strange. I don't know, Jesse, what do you think about this? Because you have to give me an advice here. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done that same thing. I apologize a lot, especially, um, you know, when I do wrong. And also, like, like if they've gone crazy or something like that or hit, like, you know, I'll apologize. Maybe I've done something to demonstrate that because they are mirrors of us, you know, and um, that's and that's absolutely wonderful. Another thing that you're doing by apologizing is you're demonstrating. You're demonstrating an example that when they make mistakes, then I found that like they're quicker to apologize, right? Because because I do. And I think that's wonderful. And I think um, another thing that I think we're demonstrating now when I'll bring up is when you can hear some, you know, noise in the background and then I go on mute and like tell them to be quiet. But overall, they're being very good. You know, and I think that's something to notice too, right? And where our attention goes, our energy flows and that which we give attention to increases. So rather than like getting off and then um, be like, you know, why did you, you know, I told you to be quiet, but they were so good so much of the time, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go and um, and tell them how awesome they're being. Like I'm telling them now, hopefully they're listening. I don't know. But um, but reward good behavior, even the little, even if it's like, even if they were going crazy 90% of the time, let's look at the 10%, you know, because we've all like had probably our parents, like if we took score, you know, our grades home and it was like 80%, you know, that's good. But what about this 20%? You know, that doesn't, that kind of attitude doesn't encourage our kids. So rather than that, okay, you got 20% correct. (laughs) You know, even if they were like eight wrong and two right on an exam. Okay, you got these two right. Let's go. How can we make that better? Right. But celebrate the wins, even the little wins. Wow, this is an amazing reminder, Jesse. I'm so grateful for this. I have not done this in a few weeks what an awesome time to get a reminder before the holidays before christmas before yes kids maybe go a bit even more crazier with some sweets maybe to just see the good and even if we have listeners that don't have children this is a great reminder our friends our fearless friends to just see the good in everything around you it's a decision that you need to make consciously every single second it's not like you decide yesterday and you expect things to be awesome today as well unless you put again the focus this personal development jesse it is like eating like washing every single day we just sometimes forget (laughs) even if we had the best podcast even if we had the most amazing mentor coaching us a few weeks earlier we still need to do the work every single day so this is an amazing reminder jesse thank you for that and since you mentioned implementing steps would it be okay if you share with us the first step maybe that you advise parents that they focus on when they empower their children as to being bilingual? What would be the first step that our parents should focus on? Okay, that's good. That's good. That's awesome. Um, So I always say the first step actually has to begin with us, right? And as with any kind of goal setting, I apply this to parenting. So Make a decision. And that's the first step is make a decision that you are raising a bilingual child, right? And if you have to think like the benefits that it will last, you know, picture like them going to university or passing an exam or their friends cheating off of them in high school or whatever you have to imagine as a result of them being bilingual, whatever you have to do. But in my case, we, I play, I was very, you know, strict at first in 
what I showed on TV. Like, because we're in Spain, every time the TV went on, I would put it in English. Now I'm not so, you know, strict and they don't generally are with me part time, but we've laid that foundation. So in the beginning, everything you put on, put on it in your target language that comes with making a decision. And that way it doesn't come with like punishment. It doesn't come with like manipulation, but this is just the way things are, right? The TV goes on, it goes on in this target language and um or a different language and that's a trick like i can get into that uh, you know after this but the first thing it has to be make a decision with yourself especially if your kids are babies like one year old or less than one year old or two years old like make that decision that you're just raising a bilingual kid so much magic happens from that and from there uh if you the trick that i did in putting Netflix on, for example, in English, in English in my case, but whatever your target language is, sometimes they'll protest to be like, I want to watch it in, you know, Spanish because their whole life is Spanish here. It's what their friends speak. Like, okay. And I, I found this out with Sophia when she was like two and going through this. I don't want English. No, English, no. And I said, okay. Because I didn't want that combative association with this language either. And this comes with like not forcing. I, I never recommend forcing and pushing, but I didn't want that to be associated, right? English is associated with rules and English is associated with, with you know, force. So I said, okay, we don't have to watch it in English, but we can't watch it in Spanish either. So we have all of these. And I, I opened up the phone and like, was like, well, we have Russian, we have Italian, we have German, we have, you know, Portuguese, whatever. Um, which one do you want to listen? Which one do you want to watch? She was two. And just because she was a little stubborn, she just chose the last thing I said, you know, it was German or something. And I thought, well, okay. So either A, she won't like it and she'll want to go back to English or B, she will like it. And that's another language that she likes and she'll be into. Right. So it was like, I like to put myself in win-win situations. So uh, it turned out we had it on for like three seconds and then she said, put it in English. Okay. But it's just those kinds of things like made a decision. She's going to, she's bilingual. Right. That's and amazing. it's, it's find the easy path, like water, find the easy path. Wow, I love it. A win-win situations. And Jesse, our kids, when they grow up, they will have such a stronger understanding of everything around them. From what I read, storytelling, when you read stories to children when, when they're small and learning a second or a third or a fourth language just gets the brain to develop so much stronger and so much quicker than the brain of someone that hasn't been exposed to these amazing opportunities that we have now. So they are going to thank you. Sophia is going to be super grateful <laughs> when she sees that she'll, she'll be doing things with so much more ease, making decisions, just being present. It's amazing what you're doing for them, Jesse. And I applaud your wonderful ambition to doing this with parents to just making this world a better place through our children we need to focus on our children but as you said start with the parents <laughs> because yes. we the parents are the ones that guide them so this is brilliant thank you for this first awesome step and to our friends that are curious and, and I know you're curious I know you want to find out more from Jesse Jesse is going to tell us in just a few seconds where can you get in touch with him how can he help you everything that you need to know about Jesse Jesse can you please share with us because I'm sure that everyone is very curious to get in touch with you and your amazing content Yes, thank you so much. And, uh, and that's so true. There are so many benefits to this. And, and like you said, the my kids will thank me, your kids will thank you, because I know you're raising bilingual kids too, right? And they're going to thank you. And that's the thing. Whenever you say, you know, 
oh, it's too hard or I don't have the time. Like think about whatever excuse that you're using now to not do it when you can. Like you speak English, Roxana, really well. So you're implementing English. There are people that speak English the same as you, if not better, and they don't do it because they're tired, because they don't want to, you know, whatever. Um, but think about 20 years down the road, you know, your child has grown. They haven't learned this new language. The excuse that you are using now, will that be valid 20 years from now? Will that be the right excuse that that stops that? I mean, if you were faced with your child and, the, and they're 20 and they say, why didn't, you know, you speak English so well, or you speak what Spanish so well, why didn't you use it with me? <laughs> what if you tell them what you're telling yourself now? Uh-huh. Is that valid? Right. So that's something to think about. And that's something I've thought about before. So thank you for bringing that back up into my mind. And I have a... Uh, I have a workshop. It's actually just a 60 minute lesson because I know a lot of parents don't have time. So I wanted to keep it short. It gives like three essentials. And we touched on the first uh, today, which is make a decision. That's the first step, right? And then it takes you through a detailed explanation of two other steps that you can follow to effortlessly implement this new language into raising bilingual or multilingual kids. And uh, that's completely free. That's at Eagle Method. Well, eaglemethod.newzendler.com at the moment. But you can just find me on Facebook at Jesse James Swede. Uh, It's me right now. I have a blue plaid shirt on. Jesse James Swede. Instagram at Jesse underscore Swede. And um, TikTok at Jesse Swede. Awesome, Jesse. Thank you. And to our friends listening, know that you are going to have all of Jesse's links in the comments, in the description of the Spotify version on YouTube. Have a talk with Jesse. You're going to love his amazing, very different approach to life, children, and um, just having fun along the way. What I love a lot about you, Jesse, is that you have fun with your kids. As you said, You don't push it. You just make sure that they're in a situation where they always win. You cannot never be a loser if you just focus on having fun and bringing the best in you. I love it. And what you said about the excuses, Jesse, even the 1%, maybe one word per day, right? One word per day is 100% better than zero, right? Because in a month, maybe the child will learn a few, maybe 20 words, maybe less, but it's a start, right? Yeah, we're actually doing that with sign language right now, right? We're actually doing that with sign language. We're learning one new word a day. Wow. And, And they already started to put, you know, we learned like party today. No, party today. And Sophia put it together. I going to a party, you know, so oh. they put things together so quickly, so well, so much faster than us. And that's another thing. Don't put our limitations on them because they they don't have them. So Jess, you are also learning sign language. How cool is that oh my god you need to talk about this you just i mean this i think it's a whole new brain a new whole part of the brain developing with this because you have the movements you have the signs and everything wow yeah when my kids leave they they learn that this is i love like this is classic i love you then we learn together one time that like this means i love you a lot and so we do that together as we leave that's amazing well Jesse I can only congratulate you and I see a small hand over there oh my god (laughs) who is there I want to see that this is Dante he I need to remind him how awesome he is because something happened and I need to figure that out later um but they were so they were they were so good today so we have to go get cookies You are amazing children. Jesse, thank you for today. It has been a great honor. It's just a great pleasure to see your beautiful children. Hi, Dante. Hi, Sophia. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. You really are good and you are amazing. So cute. Look at Sophia. Oh my God. 
Guys, I hope you have a great day ahead. Thank you so much for your amazing wisdom, Jesse. I really appreciate it so much. And I advise everyone to go and have a talk with Jesse. He is amazing. Learn from him. Go on TikTok, find him, follow him, and start implementing his amazing advice. Jesse, again, thank you for an amazing talk today. I appreciate you. I appreciate your energy so much. And uh, and I'll see you in the uh, Business Connect groups too. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Roxana.